I was a kid, I was a huge TED fan, and I remember watching the videos, and it's, it's a fantastic opportunity that I get to share the same stage as so many great minds. Uh, with that said, today's talk is gonna be very interesting. I have a lot to share with you guys, so it's gonna be really sciencey. So before we get into all the technical uh, things, let me start off with a small story from my childhood. So, as you can see, when I was a kid, my dad used to take me up to the Terrascore house and take me down and show me one of the most beautiful sights that nature has to behold. I was always fascinated by the beauty of the night sky until once, uh, when I was seven years old, my dad, uh, for the first time, he told me, did you know that these stars are actually much bigger and much brighter than our sun? Well, now that we know about this, this as a fact, we think it's really trivial. But let's all admit that when we first found that out, it blew our minds, okay? So, uh, but then this had led me to ask many questions. One of them being, how is a star that is so far away, that is light years far away from Earth, able to produce so much energy that we here sitting on Earth could see that star. I mean, after all, I remember being a kid and forgetting to turn off the tube light and my parents calling me saying that you're wasting power. So how, if power is so scarce, how is a star being able to power itself such a way that we, staying light years away, can see it? This has led me to find an answer to one of the biggest problems that we as a civilization face today and that's sustenance. That's right, uh, sustenance. So what do we as a race need to survive? Well, we need food, water, shelter, and recently, these memes on Facebook that say Wi-Fi. But no, I'm not here to talk about that meme. I'm here to talk about something far more important than Wi-Fi. I'm here to talk about something that defines the past two centuries. I'm talking about power. The one thing that differentiates civilization in the past two centuries from the tens and thousands of years before us is power. This is a fact. What is also a fact is that we are quickly running out of methods of fuel to power our lives. So this is beautifully illustrated by one of my favorite physicists, Michio Kaku, who says that there's three types of civilizations. Type one. A type 1 civilization powers itself with the power of the planet. A type 2 civilization powers itself with the power of the entire star. And a type 3, which powers itself with the power of the entire galaxy. Now, I'd like to ask all of you, what part, which civilization do you think we are? Well, if you said type 1, you're most certainly wrong, because we aren't type 1. We're actually type 0. We don't even register on the scale of civilization. That's because we power ourselves with dead fuel, uh, dead plants and animals, what we call fossil fuels. Now, if we want to transform ourselves from a type zero civilization to a type one civilization, we need to be able to harness the power of the sun, or in scientific terms, nuclear fusion. But wait. Don't we already have nuclear energy? Well, yeah, that's nuclear fission. Fission is something that we're all very familiar with. It's when you take a nucleus, which is very heavy, very unstable, radioactive, and you bombard it with a neutron. When you bombard it with a neutron, it splits into two different atoms and releases a huge amount of energy. Now, we've perfected this kind of power. We've, have, we've had nuclear reactors, yet, the number one thing that you see about nuclear fission today is the disasters, the Fukushima disaster, the pleas by the Carolites not to put um, a reactor in their state, and so on and so forth. And then we have the mess that we have to deal with about radioactive waste. Well, I guess the central theme of today's topic is, if not fission, how will fusion serve us any better? To answer that question, let us first tackle the problem of what fusion really is. So. How is fusion different? We all know that in nature, we never find a hydrogen atom alone. We never find H, right? We always find H2, but why is that? That's because every atom has a goal of being stable. And hydrogen knows that it's going to be stable when it takes the configuration of helium. And that's why they bond with each other and form H2. Now, this is a trivial question that everyone needs to ask. 
instead of bonding with each other, why don't they just collapse into each other? I mean, one proton, one electron, one proton, one electron, right? If they fuse, they become two protons and two electrons, which is exactly what helium is. But there's a problem with this. They don't fuse together because of, like the culprit for almost all the problems, physics. Uh, they, they have something, uh, they're, they're governed by the forces of electromagnetism, which means that when there's a positive charge and a positive charge, you, they always repel each other. But, and, and that's why two nuclei never combine and collapse into one another. But provide them with enough force, provide them with enough energy, and then instead of the electrostatic repulsion, you find something else. You find something called the strong nuclear force. Now, this strong nuclear force is what brings them together at the final instant after a certain amount of distance. It collapses them into one another. And that is what nuclear fusion basically is. That reaction is what nuclear fusion is. Wait, did I, did I mention that this reaction happens to generate 13.7 million electron volts from just two atoms? Yeah, that's the part that we're after. That's the energy's part is what we're after. So. That's what nuclear fusion is. Now, we, um, th this is exactly how the sun is powered. Now, when we're talking about harnessing the power of the sun, we're talking about harnessing the power of nuclear fusion. So this is the kind of breakthrough that we need. Now, now that we understand what fusion is, let's talk about how it serves as a fuel. For any fuel uh, to be taken seriously, we learned in 10th grade that it needs to base on certain indices. Indices like its efficiency, its availability, its green effect, and most importantly, its cost. When it, when it pertains to all these factors, it's a good fuel. So where does nuclear fusion stand in all of this? Well, let's go through each one um, individually. First, we'll tackle the problem of efficiency. Nuclear fusion reaction is about 80% efficient. Now, that might not seem a lot, but if you put that into perspective, take the highest grade of coal, anthracite. When you burn that coal, it has a 12% efficiency. That means for every 100 grams of coal that you burn, you're basically utilizing just 12 grams worth of energy. On the contrary, for nuclear fusion, when you burn 100 grams of fusionable material, you actually use 80% of its energy. That is unprecedented in terms of fuels. No other fuel has the same amount of energy as nuclear fusion does. Now, the next factor is availability. So what do we need for nuclear fusion? Well, we need two things, deuterium and tritium. And even though the names sound really complex, they're just different forms of hydrogen. They're just isotopes of hydrogen. And where do we find lots of hydrogen? Our seas. So we have all the water on planet Earth. And recent studies have shown that if all this water were to be used up in nuclear fusion energy, we'd have a fuel that would sustain for 2 billion years. I'd say that that's unprecedented in terms of any fuel's availability. Now let's go on to the part that really matters, the green effect. In today's world, it's a reality about how soon our world's degrading because of carbon emissions, because of nuclear waste. We don't know where to store it. We don't know what to do with it. In today's world, every fuel needs to come with a green effect. Now, what, now considering nuclear fusion, when a fusion reaction happens, the only byproduct that it generates is pure energy. And when it generates pure energy, it's the ideal green fuel because it has no byproducts. In fact, scientists have gone so far as saying that nuclear fusion is the single-handed most uh, green efficient technology there is, even more so than solar power itself. Now, I know what you're all thinking, and if you don't, I'd be surprised. Why are we using fusion right now? Why aren't we doing this to power our plants? Why aren't we doing this to power our lives? Well, Every story has one big twist, and here the twist, and here the problem for nuclear fusion, and making it a reality is the cost of it. When we talk about cost, nuclear fusion becomes a reality. Nuclear fusion is so costly because it's just so hard to achieve. For, when you look, uh, sorry, 
for those of you who have actually followed the story of nuclear fusion, that is, uh, the concept of nuclear fusion originated in the 1920s. Uh, back then, they said that in 30 years, we'll have nuclear fusion. In the 1950s, they said, no, no, no. It's actually 30 years later. And 30 years later, they said 30 years later. But here we are in 2015, and we still aren't running on nuclear fusion. Well, now I know what you're all thinking. This fuel sounds great on paper, like many other fuels, but it isn't practical. And there's been no development. That's wrong. Nuclear fusion hasn't been stagnating f since 1920, contrary to popular belief. Now, to prove that to you, to put that in perspective, let me just pull out something from my pocket here. Uh, how many, before that, how many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Moore's Law is a very famous law that states that the number of transistors on a square inch doubles every two years. Even though it's all uh, mind-boggling, what it basically means is that we are developing our technologies at never higher rate, which basically means that the smartphone that I have right now in my hand has more computing power than that of the entire NASA's team when they sent the first men to the moon and successfully got them back. My phone has more computing power than the whole team. And this progress has been, uh, has been given to us in just three decades of development. Now, you, you would think that the Moore's Law is one of the most fastest laws and the growth is evident. But what if I tell you that nuclear fusion develops at the same rate as that of Moore's Law? If you see that graph, you can see that they're both on the same axis. The development in nuclear fusion is same as that of Moore's Law, which means that even though we can't see its development, it is developing at a very, very high pace. And before I go into the next topic, I'd like you all to pay attention to where that graph ends at 2005. Keep that at the back of your mind. And on the top of the graph, if you see the break-even line, I want you to keep that uh, line in mind. The graph basically says that we'll achieve this break-even line somewhere in the next decade. Okay, so with that at the back of your hand, now you know that fusion is a great fuel on paper. It's also been progressing at a very, very high rate. But why aren't we able to practically do it? That's the question that's on our mind. Because when we're talking in terms of reality, it is so hard, and just to give you an idea of how hard it is, the only way nuclear fusion is done is through something called inertial compartmental fusion. Now, what this means is essentially you take fusion fuel, hydrogen, and put it into a small table tennis uh, ball-like structure. And then you provide immense heat to that ball, that canister. The heat is so intense that the speed of the nuclei rises to to such an extent that the strong nuclear force overcomes the, um, the electrostatic force, and then fusion happens, as you can see in the diagram over there. But we don't know how much heat to produce. That heat is what is required for fusion to happen, 150 million degrees centigrade, not something your average stove can do. So you can see why this is a problem. Um, so. That is the biggest problem, but, and here's a fair warning to all the Star Wars fans in the audience, if you're into lightsabers, if you're into lasers, you're gonna absolutely love the next part because it has to do with exactly that. This is a 50 milliwatt laser, right? Uh, it's a handheld laser, and uh, I'd like to show you guys a video, and this is because physical demonstration is not possible uh, in an indoor area. I'd like to show you a demonstration of what this laser with just 50 milliwatt of power can do. There we go. So basically what happened there is, with just light, nothing but light, we were able to fire matchsticks from a distance. And with this 50 milliwatt laser, I can even etch on black surfaces and put holes in black plastics. Now, with this in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you for a moment to think about this. If a laser of 50 milliwatt is able to produce that much power, 
What would a laser of 500 terawatt power be able to produce? What kind of heat it would generate? 500 terawatt is 500 terawatt is 5 with 17 zeros after it in terms of milliwatts. Just try to imagine the kind of heat that would produce. Now, this is exactly the kind of laser system that's at work at the NIF in California. NIF stands for National Ignition Facility. Now, what they've tried to do is achieve inertial compartmental fusion using the same way that this laser is built. They focus thousands of lasers onto a tiny canister so it gets so heated that fusion occurs. Now, why is this important? Well, I asked you all to remember um, the graph, right, in 2005 and the break-even energy. Uh, what happened is, in 2013, for the first time in the history of nuclear fusion, we have not only broke even on the power that we have supplied, but we have actually gotten more power from the reaction than we have put in for the first time ever. We broke the graph. Now, what this means is that we've essentially successfully been able to do fusion. And finally, we can actually say that it's not 30 years away, but rather just five years away. But what is five years away? Something called ignition. That's what the I in NIF stands for. Achieving ignition is when the lasers, uh, the, the nuclear fusion produces so much energy that that in turn powers the lasers, which in turn runs the system, which gives more energy. And you can see how that's a big cycle and how we can harvest unlimited amounts of energy from that cycle. That is the goal of the NIF. And it is going to be a reality somewhere around 2020 for the first time. And fusion is not 30 years away. Ladies and gentlemen, um, nuclear fusion is the breakthrough energy if we want to develop into a type 1 civilization instead of fizzling out as a type 0 civilization. When we ask ourselves, are all the billions of dollars that we spend on nuclear fusion worth it? Let's try to answer that from the perspective of someone living 100 years in the future. Us as a race, humans, we've never been scared to invest in the hopes of a better return. But today, we stand at the altar of a paradigm shift to lead us into a new generation of powering ourselves. Let us be the brave pioneers that have taken this approach and gone far into the future. I'd like to end or summarize this, uh, uh, this documentation with the quote of Albert Wanchan, who beautifully said, discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. Thank you very much for this opportunity.